of the organization and its health is a fascinating exploration of the links between the psyche, the soma and the social. Richard has brought together an, ana an analysis of the related themes of intrapsychic group and organizational perspectives and how unconscious processes underpin and link all of them. His focus is on the impact of these processes on the health of both the organization and the workforce. He brings together that which normally is compartmentalized, linking the individual skin with the organizational skin. He demonstrates in many different ways how paying attention to the body may be a way of understanding what is happening in the organization. Richard relates these ideas about skin to Beyond's theory of container contained and shows us how these ideas are crucial for effective organizational transformation. He also explores in some depth Beyond's theory of basic assumptions around group functioning relating the proto-mental matrix to the group skin with examples drawn from the field of group relations. Apart from the unusual subject matter, which I certainly have not seen analysed in this way before or elsewhere, this book is original in two other ways. Firstly, Richard has integrated the intrapsychic with the systemic at the societal level. Secondly, he's integrated the contributions by two other colleagues, Nuno Torres and Kevin Dixon, and this feels generous warm and collaborative, three adjectives that in my experience apply particularly to Richard's personality. <laughs> on this note, I would like to hand over to Richard and invite him to tell you more about the experience of writing this uh, answer. I, I first of all wanted to thank you uh, for, for coming. Uh, one of the things that touches me particularly is the wide range of, uh, of, of people, friends, family, uh, organizational colleagues, psychotherapy colleagues that you represent. Um, I also feel honored uh, uh, here amongst the number of uh, well-reputed authors uh, and hopefully uh, authors in the making will be inspired by all of this writing that uh, Karnak have uh, published. Uh, including the best bit of every book I was always told was the pictures and the stories. <laughs> uh, one one le very legitimate way of approaching uh, reading this book is uh, just to go through the pictures, first of all. Uh, there's some cartoons in chapter six. Um, and the stories are hopefully, hopefully put in italics, so you could just go through and read those <laughs> and see what you think of those, and then later, if you happen to be interested, you can uh, look at some of my conclusions. Uh, and, and tentative ideas, which Olya so brilliantly outlined. Um, as I, I said in my acknowledgements in the book, uh, when I asked her to do it, I had uh, very little hope that somebody could pull the whole thing together in a way that would make more sense of it than I did. You did that, so thank you very much indeed. I was particularly grateful to um, the sculptor Anthony Gormley, who gave permission for um, this remarkable photograph to be um, on the cover. It's called Critical Mass, Critical Mass 2 in fact. Um, he says about it, the collective body, the body is the collective subjective and the only means to convey collective human experience perceived in a commonly understood way. It was just the picture for this book. Yeah, so, so I had to have it. Um, the, the original Critical Mass, Critical Mass 1, appeared in the early 1990s uh, in a um, disused uh, Viennese railway station from which uh, Jews had been taken to the Holocaust camps. Uh, and he clustered these 60 figures in, uh, in a tight ball in a very moving way. I, some of you may have seen the pictures of it. To have it installed with them all spread out on the top floor of an Art Deco building um, situated um, on, on the, uh, what I think those who live there call the Costa Geriatrica, <laughs> um, England's answer to the Costa del Sol, 
in, in this sort of healthy atmosphere with um, the spread of these traumatized bodies uh, in, as it were, a health resort seemed to embody something about the book. The basic purpose of the book, as I said at the beginning, is to provide a framework to explore the emotional experience of being a body in an organization. And I don't just mean working organizations, I also mean the voluntary ones as well, because those are at least as important and include uh, churches and rotary clubs and social groups and what goes on in community halls and so on. Uh, at the same time, it seeks to explore belonging to an organisational body with members. Beyond this search for stories and hypotheses that might begin to order such experience is an exploration into the health of the organisation and the health of its key resource, its workforce. I suppose the thing I really want to get at is what is, what is it that holds the group together? Uh, what is it that sustains its morale, its esprit de corps is the French phrase, isn't it? Uh, which brings in the body straight away. Uh, my, my version of understanding it, which is the one I use in, um, in consulting with organisations, is, is what is it that makes you people get out of bed in the morning to get to work? Um, to begin to get the feel of, of what motivates the, the, the culture. Um, I, I wanted to say one more thing and then tell a story that isn't in the book. Um, as as Olio said, one of the key uh, reference points that I use has to do with the psychology of skin. Um, in the psychoanalytic field, uh, skin has been slowly developed, another of these slow-burning ideas, as an idea to try to understand the way in which people without very much emotional security somehow cope with uh, needing to create something around themselves as a protection, as a, a point of transition and communication, and as a way of um, communicating their hurt and pain and suffering when that's what they're experiencing. Um, we can also see, of course, uh, the way people play with skin. Um, tattoos, earrings, piercings. Some of it cruel, some of it abusive. Um, some of it creative. Uh, I, I developed the idea to think of the skin of an organisation because that's what people borrow for their, for the, for, for their own inner organisation. To feel a <coughs> sense of security inside, they belong. They belong to a group, they have an identity. Um, the, the identity of the group is terribly important. You come across it, I think, most viciously and most benignly in racial identity which people can mock, so that people snatch away the carpet underneath the right of somebody to have a particular kind of skin, uh, or else people feel uh, valiantly proud about it and glory in it. It can go both ways. Um, I develop it to think about the experience of shame and shamelessness, uh, and the way in which so often the um, the issues we deal with in organisations as well as clinically have to do with people who've behaved shamelessly and made other people suffer by lack of tact, lack of thought, lack of consideration uh, or actual um, uh, abuse uh, and uh, intrusion. Uh, some people think um, that uh, the behaviour of the financial institutions uh, recently in the last three years uh, reveals some of this shameless behaviour, uh, and I've, I've written about that in the book with a, with a colleague. 